Some people, old people, talk about think tanks. Younger people talk about invention tanks. Here, we at DLD, we talk about hacker tanks. Come on stage, Pablos, come on stage. What's your name? Come. He is not only a, a good hacker, you both are good hackers, but I good don't. Hacker. He is also my dancing teacher. Yeah. He is the best dancer I know. <laughs> and girls, we'll if, find out tonight. girls, if you have the chance to dance with him, it's a real wonderful mm. experience. So it's a hacker tank. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I, Thank you, Steffi. I dance with the, you too. Yeah, okay. come dance with Eric. Okay. Eric's okay. first time here. Um, Hello. Most of you probably know me already a little bit. So, what's this? Speaker's notes. Huh. We have notes? Both have a hacker career. Huh. <laughs> it's a career. <laughs> we could tell our moms. Okay. Um, okay, so I guess bring up my slides if they exist. Do they exist? Okay. I'm Pablo. This is Eric Johansson. Uh, we work in a lab called Intellectual Ventures. Which is a little bit unique place. Um, we mostly just work on inventing stuff. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. A uh, little review for those of you who do not know me. This is my fourth time at DLD, which means I'm running out of things to tell you about, so I'm making shit up on the fly. But in the past, I showed you how to hack into hotel TV networks to control what everybody else in the hotel is watching, in case you get bored. Showed you a robot that Eric and I built that can drive around and find wireless network users and show them their passwords on the screen. This is a project Ben Lori and I worked on where we used uh, Bluetooth and phones and laptops and things. We just set a computer in each room of a conference. This was the, called the Computers Freedom and Privacy Conference. And that red line shows, unbeknownst to him, the travels of Kim Cameron, the chief privacy architect at Microsoft as he wandered around through the conference over the course of the day. And so we were trying to show, thank you, a passive surveillance network. It's kind of an unintended consequence of Bluetooth. In this case, we could do the same thing with GSM with slightly more expensive equipment. We're trying to show the same thing as possible with RFID that's in your credit cards and in your passports and IDs and things. Um, I also showed you how to meet chicks on MySpace. How to meet chicks on MySpace using spam filters how to pick locks, steal cars, hack into Jeff Pulver's voicemail, um, how to steal credit cards from uh, people's pockets without even getting their wallets out of them. OK, so we're not going to hack into anything this time. Uh, don't be disappointed. Um, we came completely unarmed, almost completely unarmed. What we wanted to do is show you about our work in the lab. Now, um, where we're at, uh, we invent stuff largely in a scheme that's um, kind of sponsored by other companies. So companies come to us, larger companies especially, who aren't necessarily really good at inventing things in-house, they're really good at delivering a product. And they'll bring problems to us and we'll work on that and try and come up with ideas for them. All we do is invention. And so we specialize in that and we try and get good at it. We have every tool in the world. This is a picture of uh, our machine shop. But we also have a 23,000 square foot warehouse of overflow tools that don't fit in the lab. So almost anything that, that you can dream up, we can try and build in the lab and test it out and figure out if it's going to work and be possible. Um, so machine shop, this is a photonics lab with lasers. We can, we can control laser pulses down to a femtosecond, which is about how long it takes for light to travel the width of a human hair. And there's all kinds of amazing stuff you can do with lasers when you can provide that type of control. Computational clusters, so we do a lot of things. As much as I love to build things in the lab, a lot of times um, what happens is somebody will rationally suggest that we model it in software first. So I'm modeling things in software, and we, and we use uh, large piles of computers to run those simulations. And it's a wonderful thing that's possible. You've seen other examples of this. I see data visualization things going on around here. But I spent most of my life trying to get computers to the point where they were fast enough and useful enough that we could actually model the real world and get answers like this. And now 
they're plenty fast. And the slow part is just keeping up writing code to make them do useful things. And so, so we can do amazing things these days that weren't possible in the past. We also have a culinary sciences lab where we're trying to work on the science of cooking and the science of behind food. A lot of what we do is by tradition, and it's by old wives' tales, and, and, uh, and what we we're taught works. But it's actually quite crude, and there's a lot of things that we can learn now about what's actually going on when you're cooking. This group, which I don't work on, is making a 1,500-page um, tome on the science of cooking, and I hope it'll be out in the next year. I really want them to ship this book so that we can get them back into inventing stuff around food. But um, it'll be something like 80 pounds and come on a pallet, and yeah, it's going to be the biggest book on cooking ever. These are just some examples of photos from their project. We do a lot of these things where we cut away, we cut kitchen tools in half in the shop, and then they'll do these cross-sectional photos of, of the cooking process. Um, so you can see what's happening, and it's actually comical because now a few companies have been finding out about what we're doing, and they keep sending us their products because they want us to cut them in half and, and, <laughs> and put them in the book. Um, these are just examples of what the, uh, a page in the cookbook will be like. It'll be about, I don't know, half science lessons for chefs, and then the other half is these ridiculous 15-page recipes that might take you the rest of your life to perform. Um, <laughs> I'm making fun of our own product. Yeah, anyway. Um, Oh, I wonder what that slide was supposed to be. Oh, okay, so anyway, what's the point of all this? Um, if you've seen me speak in the past, what I'm trying to show you is not so much problems with stuff that you should be scared about and the security implications of things. That's mildly interesting, and I'm not, you know, I'm not opposed to just terrifying you for the entertainment value, but what I like to do is illustrate that the mindset of hackers is really good for discovering what's possible. And so those are the points I'm usually trying to make when I'm talking to you guys. And, um, and the reason for that is that hackers don't take anything for granted about what something is built to do. They're going to take the screws out, figure out what's inside, figure out what the unintended possibilities are, and what we can build from the rubble. This is a, probably the most boring slide ever. It's a protocol diagram for SSL. This is the kind of thing we play with all the time. It's a protocol that is used to uh, secure, how many air quotes can I get with these hands? Um, the connection between your web browser and your bank, right? So when you send your password and that kind of thing, this is what's going on. This is a little more what it would look like to a hacker, a whole bunch of ones and zeros. But what is interesting about this is we'll attack that at every point in the protocol. And we'll just look for what happens if I flip this little one to a zero, or vice versa. And what happens if I send it some data it wasn't expecting? And what happens if I don't send the response as fast as it was expecting? Or if I send it 100 responses instead of one? There's all kinds of things you can do in any given protocol to figure out what's, what's possible. This is a protocol diagram for malaria. So in the lab, what we try to do is work on um, some of the bigger, harder problems that the world has that other people aren't necessarily set up to work on. So in the case of malaria, Bill Gates asked us to work on this and see if we could come up with ideas around helping to eradicate malaria. So this is the life cycle for malaria. It's very complex. It spends some time in a mosquito. It spends some time in humans. Eric likes to say that um, billions of mosquitoes die every year because humans infect them with malaria. <laughs> Um, about a million people a year, kids, mostly in Africa, die of malaria. And it's a solvable problem. You haven't been dying of malaria, and your friends don't, because we've eradicated it from almost everywhere else on the planet. But Africa remains pretty hard, and it's a severe problem there. And we will plan an eradication campaign in our lifetimes, and we will figure out how to get rid of it once and for all. So in our lab, we're, at least Eric and I, are trying to apply the mindset of computer hackers to solving these problems and attacking malaria at every point along the way. And we have a couple of projects related to that. Um, incidentally, the reason that we don't have malaria largely is because we sprayed the rest of the world where it mattered with DDT, which works, but it's politically unpopular and we're trying to find other ways that, um, that we might be able to attack malaria in Africa that are sort of less controversial. So one of the ways we do that 
is again computational modeling. Right now we have what we think is the world's most advanced epidemiological modeling team. This is a group of computer scientists mostly who are working on creating a Monte Carlo simulation. This is Madagascar turned on its side so it fits on your screen, but ultimately we'll do this for the rest of Africa. This shows you the life cycle of malaria spread across Madagascar over the course of the year. So the red stuff is, uh, is uh, the prevalence of, of malaria through infections and things. In the winter, it goes down. And as you can see, here's April, May, June, July. It starts getting red, right? And over the course of the year, it comes and goes. So with a model like this, we can start testing interventions. And so we can figure out, what if we spray DDT here in June versus January? What if we get a few more bed nets here at this time of year? This model is pretty elaborate. It takes into account climate information, rainfall, the travel of humans, which is a huge problem for malaria and other epidemics. What happens in this case is you have asymptomatic carriers, which means people who have malaria but don't know it, they'll travel back to some place where you've already gotten rid of it and spread it back. And so what you've got to be able to do is model the transience of humans and be able to figure out if you can affect that in ways. So we have a number of projects around figuring out what we could do there. And I'll have Eric talk about the one that he works on the most, which is probably our most notorious malaria project. So um, attacking a system, that's one of the things that we've been focusing on at the lab. And um, there have been lots of um, very reasonable ways people have suggested to combat malaria, and lots of completely outlandish ones. And so. Uh, one of our goals of the lab is not necessarily to, to eliminate things that, that may seem outlandish, but actually attempt to demonstrate whether they are or are not feasible. So along those lines, I've been working on a project to basically uh, attempt to suppress mosquito populations using lasers. So to that end, um, before this uh, seems completely unreasonable, the basic premise of the idea is we can put a perimeter around a region. This is, uh, I think, a hospital or clinic, and this is just someone's home. This illustrates a, a barrier around a, a region. And um, the way this system effectively works is we use uh, light, you know, like LED flashlights in this case. It bounces to the other fence post and then comes back again using very simple sensor technology, which I've, you know, everyone here probably has a camera in their pocket. We're able to actually optically track an, a mosquito. At that point, we then shine a low-power laser pointer at them, and we get a strong signal coming back, which contains their actual wing beat frequency. So by analyzing their body size, their flight patterns, and their wing beat frequency, we can identify their, whether or not it is a mosquito. We can pick up uh, their gender and other sorts of attributes about the insect. That's pretty interesting from a systems perspective if you're thinking about attacking something, because something like DDT uh, is not very personal. It has environmental impacts that are hard to quantify. It has side effects that we're still starting to understand. It's easy for it to get misused. Um, so something like this is, is a very personal sort of uh, message. And ultimately, it's not, we're not here to uh, just kill all the mosquitoes. We're actually here to suppress malaria. So looking at the life cycle of the malaria parasite, you have a lot of cases where it's actually very vulnerable to different forms of uh, environment, like you can see in those in the map you saw earlier, uh, during winter when there's not a lot of rainfall, there's not a whole lot of malaria outbreaks because the insect population is very low. So by simply reducing the numbers or even reducing the lifespan of a mosquito, you can ha have profound impact so, on. Eric's a little bit understated about this, but he bought a bunch of equipment on eBay and stuck it together, and the thing finds mosquitoes flying 100 feet away and shoots them down with laser beams. <laughs> Which, <laughs> yeah. So this is some illustration in case showing you that. Huh? Just showing uh, picking up wing beat frequency of, of mosquitoes as well as other other insects. Right. Actually, it's a good question. I heard, what do you do with false positives? And and the thing about it is, so that's why we use wing beat frequency. So if you walk in front of this laser and you are not flapping your wings at the same frequency as a mosquito specifically an Anopheles defensi female, then we won't shoot you. Yeah. <laughs> so Pablos was hinting at eBay and other sorts of consumer electronics. Um, you know, 
one of the big questions we have is, is this technically possible? The other one is, is it uh, you know, actually potentially effective to use out in the field? And a lot of that has to do with cost. So when we start looking at components that go into a system like this, um, conveniently, a lot of the products have already been built for us. The components that are in this system are more or less illustrated by these components you see here. We have LEDs, technology, high power LEDs has come a long ways in recent history. You know, Blu-ray diodes, for example, are um, very, very inexpensive and high powered. Uh, imaging sensor technology is advancing very, very rapidly, and the cost is pretty much dropped out of the market. So um, the component costs that go into a system like this are, in essence, no more complicated than your DVD burner you have in your house, if you think about a moving beam on a surface of a disk. Well, and right? I think the important thing about that, too, is all these components follow Moore's law, right? So regardless of what they cost right now, you can plot a curve for the cost of this type of thing, and at some point in the future, it'll become cost effective for whatever your, your market use is. And in the case of you know, malaria in Africa, we're going to have to make this thing pretty cheap. But if we can make a George Foreman bug zapper for your backyard, then um, you know, we might get there sooner. So, Anything else you want to say about that? No, okay. we'll hopefully have time for questions later. OK. All right, so a couple other projects we work on in the lab. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's cool stuff. Um, hurricane suppression. So, um, turns out hurricanes, if you don't know already, are fueled by heat from the sun irradiating off the surface of the ocean. So, we we're thinking, what if you could just cool down the surface of the ocean a little bit? Maybe the hurricanes wouldn't get up to such devastating speeds. What this animation is showing is an invention of ours which is real damn simple. It's a tube, you stick in the ocean. Hot water is pushed by waves, which are free, into the top. That creates a pump. The hot water comes down 200 meters below, mixes up with cold water. And hopefully, if you have enough of these things in the ocean, you can bring down the surface to temperature. Maybe half a degree is enough to make the difference between a Cat 5 and a Cat 4 hurricane. So again, this is another large-scale project um, that humans might never get around to, but we're trying to show technically that this could be possible. And if you have uh, problems with, um, you know, from side effects of global warming or whatnot causing more hurricanes, this might be necessary. So we've done a little research to show that this could be possible. Another invention we work on a little bit uh, are, is related to reversing the effects of global warming. Um, this is called the Stratoshield. The way it works is basically a hose, like a garden hose, up to the stratosphere, 20 kilometers up. And it spits out sulfur dioxide. What you see in the illustration is little sulfur dioxide particles spread out in the stratosphere to reflect a little bit of sunlight before it gets in and warms up greenhouse gases. All right? Again, kind of a crazy idea, but if you don't curb CO2 emissions fast enough, which all evidence seems to be that we're not doing it fast enough, then you might need a backup plan to buy yourself a little bit of time. And what we think is that we don't want to wait till the last minute to get into that. We want to get started now on researching these things. And so we're always trying to find help researching whether these things would work or not. This one's pretty interesting because unlike a lot of other geoengineering schemes that would cost billions and you know, possibly more to do, we think we can do this for like tens of millions of dollars. It's actually really cheap. One of these hoses in the Arctic should be enough to reverse the Arctic ice loss back to pre-industrial levels, right? Which means the ice that's, uh, the polar ice caps that are disappearing now, we can restore them with just one of these hoses. Um, you can see here, these are again computer simulations, but showing the difference. Without intervention, these are actually kind of hard to parse, but it means the red stuff is what um, they should have been. The blue stuff is what we're getting. If we turn on the right side, if we turn on a, uh, one of these hoses, we can restore some of that um, ice back to the levels that you would like to see. These are, again, a little difficult to read, but showing over the course of 60 years um, what the difference in the ice loss is. The red one on the left, you can see it just goes down in the middle of the summer. It goes down almost to nothing. It's kind of, kind of scary. And the one on the right shows what it would be like 
uh, if we could make this system work. So another big problem that we've spent a little time working on is um, this stuff. These are stainless steel casks. Each one stores uh, depleted uranium from the enrichment process for nuclear reactors. Today's nuclear reactors, the way they work, is you take uranium out of the ground, and then you put it through an enrichment process to turn it into a fissionable material like plutonium. In that process, you're getting about 3% of the energy out as a fissionable material. The rest of it we store as nuclear waste. Um, the stuff is dangerous and nasty. Nobody really knows what to do with it in the long run. But fundamentally, the planet needs to transition to nuclear energy if we want to solve the problems that we have with other forms of energy and still support the billions of people who all want to live at the planet, on the planet at the same time. This is a stockpile in the U.S. and Kentucky of 700,000 metric tons of depleted uranium. We don't really have a long-term plan for storing that stuff. So we're working on a nuclear reactor that's powered by that waste. Instead of taking fuel and enriching it, and also essentially creating the proliferation problem of having these enriched fuels that could be turned into bombs, we just take the nuclear waste that we have sitting around, stick it in our reactor, and burn it. The way this works is uh, there's no moving parts. You take this, is, this represents uranium. You bombard it with a neutron. What happens is as it gets redder, that's turning into a fissionable material. You see that happen here in a second. Boom. That's the process where you get some energy out. And what's going on here is we're enriching the fuel right in the reactor. It's called a traveling wave reactor. So in this design, it runs for 60 years. You light it at one end with, with like a fuse, with a little bit of plutonium. The first wave enriches the fuel. The second wave burns it. Burns from one end to the other over the course of 60 years. There's no dangerous process of swapping out fuel rods or anything. And we should be able to get quite a bit more energy out of it this way than you get out of today's reactors. So at this point, we have what we think is the world's largest advanced nuclear research group uh, working on this. That means we have about 35 people, <laughs> which is to tell you not a lot of people are working on this kind of stuff. It's the first nuclear reactor design in, in about 30 years, new technology, reactor technology. So uh, the last thing we're going to do is, um, whoops, that's, we saw that. Eric and I brought a tool from the lab, which we want to share with you, which is kind of fun, which is this thing. It's the world's fastest high-speed video camera. It can shoot about a million frames a second. Uh, we think there's about 13 of them in the world. It costs about as much as one Ferrari. Um, what we wanted to do is show you some of the things we've done in the lab here. And then um, we're going to film something on stage and have a little fun. So, um, and then it looks like we got, what did we get, 20 minutes instead of 30? Anyway, we're going to do this as fast as we can. And, um, we're going to film something here and try and show it back. And there's some, some footage here of things that we've done. We can, uh, yeah. So let's get, um, we're going to get set up to do this. Um, I need a volunteer. I chose a volunteer, which is Gary. Get up here. I know we haven't, hardly ever get Gary on stage, but he's a badass. And um, get on up here, step on up, sit in the purple chair. If we could have a little more light, please. We want all the light we can get. So one of the tricks with high-speed video is you need a ton of light because your exposure times are really short. So I can't really see anything except for the, the sun now, but it'll work out. Okay. okay, so sir, have you signed the release form? <laughs> uh, <laughs> exactly. All right, so I think we're... Are you ready? Uh, we are ready to film. Okay, here's our idea of what a fun thing to do would be. <laughs> You're, I'm not going to do this. You get to do it. But I need you to hold it right here so it's in the frame. Hold it right there with your left hand. You're right-handed. Okay, hold on. Wait, wait. I want you to shake no, this up. I want you to shake it up. I don't think so. Yeah. Here, shake it up. Shake it up good. Put it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> Shake it up good. Is it good? Are you satisfied that you've shaken it up? Okay, put it down aside. No, no, open it. Put it down aside and stab it with that. 
Nice. You ready, Eric? Uh, one wait, moment. wait, wait, wait for him to say he's ready. Okay, hold it. You gotta hold it because I don't want you to roll away from you. And that knife could end up slipping or something. So. Yeah. Okay. At your leisure. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. Go for it. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> you don't want any blood. Be careful. Use your use two hands, please. Just so you don't. I'm ready. Are you? <laughs> ah. you, you didn't get uh, very much coke on you at all. We're going to have to do that again. <laughs> you, you missed. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's, uh, let's see what that looked like. Ah. We'll see if this works. These demos are so tenuous. <laughs> Fantastic. It would be so much better if it got him in the face. <laughs> You're a little too smart for us.